and welcome to episode 11 of the second series, powered as always by Netball UK. I'm joined as always uh, by Sarah and Max coming live from their living rooms. <laughs> how, how are we girls? Good. Super good, it's sunny, isn't it? So, oh, good. we've got yeah. the, the hottest day of the year so far and we're all in our living rooms. Isn't this great? I'm, I'm disappointed we've lost the camper van, <laughs> personally. <gasps> Can I, I was just... enjoying the, um, the dungeon look we had last week from you, oh. Emma. I'm deeply disappointed because uh, for anyone who didn't hear last week's episode, where were you? Um, I was coming live from my dad's camper van on the drive, which um, I'll be honest, the black neck curtains didn't do it any favours. But just as I fell in love with it and got really at home there, my dad sold it. So I'm now back in the living room I'm, and I'm gutted because while we're doing this podcast, it's actually going to get towed away and um, they're going to come and collect it. So it's a sad day in the Jones household. Thanks for your sympathy and remorse, <laughs> Cheers for that. <laughs> I feel like the less we talk about that, the better. Um, right, let's crack on because we've got another mega show with lots to talk about. This week marks a year since Manchester Thunder roared back to win the Super League, beating Wasps in the final at the Copper Box. We're going to be chatting about the best wins, almost victories, horrible losses, and how it feels to watch a former team do well. Secondly, the fertility in netball. Our friends in Netball Scoop have opened up a big and important discussion around fertility for elite female athletes in a series of hard-hitting stories. From freezing eggs to struggling to conceive and taking time out of the game to have a baby, we're going to touch on some serious issues. But before all that, our special guest this week has been on the netball scene in England for decades, playing at the top level before moving into coaching, including Seven Stars and now London Pulse, who she joined for the 2020 season. It is, of course, Sam Bird. Hi, Ooh, Sam. Welcome, Sam. Hi, Sam. Thank, thank you so much for joining us, Sam. Thank you for uh, jumping on what is a, a weird and wonderful Netball Nation podcast we've found out, haven't we, in Isolation Girls? <laughs> No, we're not half. Oh, thank you for having me. I've, I've enjoyed watching your, your recent podcast, so um, it's nice to get you on. So, uh, um, um, well, well, we know that you've got kids and dogs that, uh, that you need to look after, so we won't keep you too long. But let's just get straight into it. First of all, Sam, congratulations on the new gig. Uh, how, how are you getting on? Uh, it's busy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's, it's really good. It's a huge challenge. Um, I've never been a CEO of a company before, um, so I'm learning lots. But um, it's a real privilege, really, and another new, I guess, another new step in my very long netball career, as you kindly mentioned. <laughs> uh, so um, it probably not an um, illogical step for me, really, and um, an ambition I've had. And um, circumstances just led to this particular opportunity arising and so I've, I've been lucky enough to take it. And you know in in your netballing career you'll have come across many a challenge but this one uh, was totally unprecedented. How are you how are you handling this whole thing in terms of sort of keeping in touch with your players and how are you dealing with the postponed season so far? Yeah so um, we, we took an early decision to um, put a plan in place where we would have calls with our players on a rota um, all through the week. So um, I speak to three players every evening um, so I've spoken to all of them but through the week um, and we're still paying our physio um, to do that as well. So between us the, the players have a call from me and a, a call from the physio each week um, and that's because they're still training and we felt that if we're going to be giving them weird training, that they're training in a different environment and unsupervised, it was really important that they still had some physio support. So my calls are more just sort of welfare, really, just see how they are. Um, as you know, loads of netball players are, are employed and some have had to face furlough in their other jobs. Um, some of them are applying to university or studying. So everybody's had a different challenge in lockdown. So it's just been an opportunity to connect in with them really um, each week to make sure they're okay. And, and how have you found that? Do you know what, I've, um, I might be just nosy, I don't know, I've really enjoyed it. Um, uh, uh, Sarah will know, when you're sort of head coach normally and you're flying around in like a normal season, it's actually quite hard to get time to speak to your athletes and um, I've quite enjoyed really having the luxury of having time to speak to them and maybe talk to them about things I wouldn't always have the time to do that. So I've, I've enjoyed it and, um, you know, it helps me as well. I always feel better having had a chat with them as well. So um, it's been a good thing both ways. Absolutely. And obviously, like you say, you're head coach and CEO at Pulse now. What's that been like combining the roles, particularly at such a weird time? 
Well, it's a bit of a honeymoon period, I think, because um, obviously I don't have the the joy and the stress of game day and um, trying to win and perform and all of that. But um, um, it, it's been okay so far. It's To be honest, most of my time is currently set at just checking where the club is at commercially, making sure we're connecting in with our partners and our sponsors and, and making sure they understand that we value them because they're more important now than ever. Um, and just still really looking to um, expand the club and expand the vision of the club really. Um, as you know, it's a brand new club at Super League level. And uh, for me, it's quite important that we, we just don't focus just on the Super League netball, but it's about accessing netball across London. And that's quite a big, ambitious programme I'm setting. Um, but that's what I'm, I'm really interested in doing as a club. Can I ask that... you a quick question? Sorry, Sorry Emma. No problem. Um, I don't suppose most people will know that you're actually a qualified lawyer. So the question is, you know, what's harder, being a CEO of a Super League franchise or working as a lawyer for the Metropolitan Police? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say it's harder working as a lawyer for the Metropolitan Police, in, in all honesty, particularly the work I did was sort of international police cooperation. So that was pretty um, challenging. But this is a completely different challenge. Um, um, and a, another one, you know, it's just another another challenge that's really interests me. And I think that's the key thing. You know, I love my work as a lawyer, like you loved working for the police as well, Mags. And um, I gave that up to really focus on the netball. And um, it's just been good timing, I guess, for me um, that an opportunity like this has arisen and I'll throw myself 100 percent into it. Um, is the plan, sorry, Sam, is the plan long term for you to carry on doing like a dual role or um, to, to focus on one and kind of hand over to someone else on, on the other? Yeah, well, I think um, what I've managed to do is um, in a very short space of time, sort of look at restructuring the club and the sort of strands of the business. And I've, I've recruited a very good um, managing director um, who was in fact involved with Natalie in setting up the club in its, when it first came to light. So I've sort of brought her back in and that the MD will probably run a lot of the day-to-day -day business things to enable me to still focus on, on the Super League. Um, but time will tell, to be honest. Um, as you know, once we're into competitive match play, it's um, a dark, long tunnel. <laughs> 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 um, so I'll have to see. But at the moment, the plan is to surround myself with good people um, in the club. There are already a lot of very good people in the club, and I want to add to that. And so that I can sort of really oversee and set set the ideas and the, the vision for the club, but then let other people do the, the real hard work and the legwork. Mm -hmm. I like it. And you mentioned as well, um, Sam, about the kind of initiatives that you're putting in place that you want to just basically get more people um, playing from different backgrounds and stuff. Um, what kind of steps are there in place or what have you done to encourage that? Um, yeah, I've, I've uh, employed a community officer whose sole responsibility will be looking at our community programmes and development. And she's got a huge portfolio ahead of her looking at um, engaging um, the disability netball, walking netball, boys, really um, targeting um, ethnic minorities in London. Um, there's still a massive underrepresentation of um, a diverse people playing netball in, in terms of the community that's in London and those that actually play. Um, and, you know, I know from my son playing football, for example, when he plays football, there's a large Eastern, commun um, Eastern European community where the boys play football and none of their sisters play netball, none of them interested. Um, and it's, it's those sorts of programmes that I'm really interested to try and promote. Um, so that the bigger community in London is accessing netball and knows what it is. I mean, you don't do things by arse, do you, Sam? Thank <laughs> you. Okay. Um, no, well, maybe you'll know, um, when, I, when I, I first, I grew up in Luton, it's a really diverse area. Oh, I had some fabulous nights in Luton with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> So that's for the X-rated. I was going to say, Indeed. we want to hear. We're going to start an after dark version. Yeah, yeah. It'd, be way, it'd be way better. <laughs> Netball <Definitely>. night time. <laughs> but um, I was lucky enough that, um, in fact, it was Cheryl Danson and a few others set up a junior league. And we, we, our, my first netball was playing on the car park of Luton Football 
stadium, Luke football ground. And, um, you know, it was just brilliant. It was once a week, you know, we were all terrible players. We all loved it. Um, and we got to know all the diverse community in Luton. You know, it's a big um, Sikh community in Luton at the time, big Irish population. And I hadn't mixed with any of those kids until I started playing netball. And we, we formed teams and I still, that still sort of forms a big part of my philosophy now. So um, that's what I, and London's obviously very similar. So I really want to sort of carry those ideas into London and, and into our club. Amazing. Amazing. Without well, drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Still I mentioned that bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bit we want to hear about. Um, but obviously, uh, Sam, Pulse were flying before the season got suspended, sitting third in the table with some very impressive wins and unbeaten. What was it about that team, do you think, that made them start so well? Um, uh, we had nothing to lose, did we? We were 10th. Uh, we came into the league um, being 10th the league the season before. Um, I, I pretty much started the team again. We, we retained three athletes from the year before. Um, I targeted, um, decided if we were going to be last, we were going to be last with talented, young, keen athletes. And um, the imports that, that, that we've managed to bring into the club have been outstanding. Um, and the leadership group we've got um, with the more experienced players have just set the tone for the younger ones. And I just think we created the right sort of balance where we've got players that are really, really hungry and want to play and want to win. Um, with the older ones just setting the right standard, really. And I think, you know, those wins were all very, apart from the Celtic game, the other two were very close. But um, winning leads to more winning. And I think it's just a group of players that became more confident as we went on. And um, for us, it was a shame that it, um, we only managed to get three matches in. But um, it was really just um, play without any fear, play without any worry. You know, we were last last year. We signed up to a club. I signed up to a club that was last. And um, the only way was up, really. So um, that, that sort of attitude is what we carried into training and into the matches. And, you, I mean, you mentioned that fearlessness there, uh, Sam, that, you know, you had nothing to lose. Do you think maybe other teams had underestimated what you could do this season? I'm not, I'm not sure underestimate is fair. I think most of Sarah will disagree or agree. I, I mean, I think most coaches looked at our player roster and thought they were pretty decent. I think the, the key thing is getting a group of players with talent to play together. And that was the sort of unknown, really. So... I think because we, we changed our player roster pretty dramatically, I think there was an inkling that we could do something um, quite exciting, but you've still got to do it at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah I mean, like for, for us in pre-season, we, we desperately wanted to play Pulse because no one had any idea what they were going to come out like. Like, like Sam said, you can put a, 10 talented players in a squad and it can work or it can not work. And... Um, we kind of wanted to get an idea of what Pulse were doing. I think what's unfortunate for you, Sam, is if we don't play again this season, you almost lose that kind of surprise attack on people. <laughs> like, <laughs> they I mean, don't see me now. After round one, everyone's got video footage and people pull each other apart <laughs> and stuff in analysis. But there's, all, there's, there's that momentum that you talk about winning causes more winning. Um, and also that that element of especially some some of the young players and, and I'm in a similar situation where you almost get a free shot in your first season at the Super League like no one really knows who you are you don't know who anyone is you go and play against some incredible players that you you kind of just take for granted because you, you're not aware of who they are as a young player and then season two it kind of bites you in the backside a little bit because people have seen you play and watched you play and it's it's almost a shame that some first year players in the Super League this year haven't had a full season of just having that complete naivety where they just go in excited and play and don't have fear and aren't really known and, and I think that that will be a shame for some players. Yeah 100% I mean you know Fumi's a good example of that. Um, oh Sam that girl and <laughs> the fact that you've managed to drag Fiona Murta back in you know, to work with your defence, but to work with Fumi in particular, she's yeah. just going to be world class. Yeah, and she's a good example of what you were just saying, you know, not really knowing what's going on, really. She's just um, going on and um, listening to Fee, which is brilliant to have Fee coaching her, and just just listening to a couple of key things, and that's all she's worried about. As you say, she's not really worried about who she's playing against, 
um, you know, she's not studied her opponents, you know, she just goes on and, and plays. Um, and uh, she is a phenomenal talent and we've got a lot of um, uh, very talented players. And um, I think you're right. I think the next thing is for them, they sort of going to have to grow up a bit now. Um, and uh, their second season will be harder. But I think the culture of winning is a strong thing at London Pulse. Our youth teams are successful year on year. And some of these players that are now filtering through to the, the Super League side have won most of their games for London Pulse as junior athletes. So um, it's keeping that culture and carrying that through to the, the senior team that that is normal. Winning is normal. Um, that'd be very nice for me if that became, <laughs> <laughs> became the case. Um, and obviously, you know, Sarah said, you know, it's, it is a shame that the season got cut short um, when you've got these players coming through with that naivety and fearlessness. In your opinion, um, Sam, what are your thoughts on the season returning? And, and if it does, how do you see it looking? Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, at the moment, there are a number of scenarios on the table. Um, um, I, I think for us, it's just about um, dealing with whatever England netball dish to us as, as a decision. Um, all the clubs were asked to put in responses to various scenarios that they came up with. And... Um, it, it's we'll just have to respond to whatever they say um we, we've even during lockdown now you know we've put in a quite a comprehensive training program for our athletes and what, what we've tried to say is that there are always short-term and long-term games games with anything so if if the league is concluded then we'll be looking to put a package in that means they've got some new carrots to work for, some new things to be interested in, to keep them motivated to carry on. If there's another scenario, then we'll work to that. But I think it's hard for athletes not to have a specific competition to work towards. And I think that's going to be the challenge for um, coaches going forward. It's, um, you know, why are we training? What's the point? Um, the, the things we've tried to talk about with our players is to, to use the time we've had so far and to really rehab their niggles. Um, Mags will know that all netballers have niggles. Um, you know, most of them get out of bed and they take 10 minutes to warm up before something stops hurting. And <laughs> um, we've tried to uh, take that time to help players rehab those niggles. Um, and so depending on, on, on the decision, we'll, we'll just have to look at new ways to, to motivate players to take the time to, to improve on their fitness, their strength, um, become better, better athletes um, so that they're ready for when netball does resume. Fingers crossed. I know, I know there's a lot of stuff that's more important in the world right now, but fingers crossed that's sooner rather than later. And we've spoken quite a bit over the last few weeks, haven't we, Mags and Sarah, about the, the fact that we need as human beings a target or something to work towards, that kind of, right, this is what I'm aiming for. Um, so like I say, fingers crossed sooner rather than later. Um, Sam, we know you've shut the kids and the dogs out. Um, so we'll let you go very shortly. But Sarah or Mags, do you have any more questions for Sam? Or, Max, do you want to reveal what happened on those nights out in Luton? It's up to you. <laughs> I couldn't possibly, because they were uh, training, England training week. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, we didn't go out. We didn't do anything we weren't supposed to. There was no alcohol consumed, <laughs> and we were all in bed by 10. Consumer <laughs> professionals. <at all. laughs> no yeah. surprise there at all. Uh, and, Sarah, have you got any questions? Um... I don't think so. I, I, I love mean, putting I, you on the spot. I know, geez, this wasn't in the script. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think, I think we've spoken about all the stuff, you know. I, I mean, Sam, from my point of view, um, I, f I feel almost worse for you than I do for most other teams just because you guys had such a good start and, and you'd put a new team together. I mean, obviously, I feel most sorry for myself most of the time, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but I know like it's tough when you've got a new team, and so um, I'm glad that you guys have, have already kind of got got plans in place for for what you're doing now and and next. And I'm excited to see a lot of the pools players. I'm excited. I guess my only question to you is, you know, 21s are due to leave um, for World Youth Cup during the season next year um, at Loughborough. We've talked a lot about that around 
what it what it will do to affect our squad if if under 21s leave in the middle of the season um for you it's probably even more so than than for us will it affect who you put in your squad in that um, yeah good question we we've had a lot of discussions about this as well um but for me um I'm all about giving people long-term opportunities. So for me, it wouldn't change my roster. Um, I'd still happy to go with, you know, put my faith in those young, talented athletes like you have at Loughborough. Um, I, I think that band, that current under-21 crop in the country is really strong. And I think it needs good competition. And the Super League is the best competition they can get. So for me, I'll, 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 I'll risk... Um, losing them. Um, you never know if they're going to be selected. Uh, we all know England selections are challenging and, you know, not everyone gets selected. It's a s small squad. So for me, I'd, I'd rather commit them to our programme for a year, give them as much playing opportunity um, as we can and we'll just run with whatever deficit we have. Um, I think it's more important to give them the opportunity to play. Yeah. Oh, Sam Bird, the busiest person in netball. Thank you so, so much for taking the time out to join us on Netball Nation. We will let you get back to everything that you've got to do. Thank but you. like I say, thank you so much. It's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you. And thank good you luck, Sam. Have a good day. All yeah, best of luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Um, now, Sam's point on getting all kinds of communities involved in the sport is an important one. Uh, so, Mags and Sara, your clubs, we know this, have got strong junior sections and good links with the community. But how else are Lightning and Rhinos involved with promoting netball in the community? And what do you reckon they, or the Super League sides, could do better? Well, I know the, the initiatives that we have at Rhinos, um, netball-wise, um, we've been really, really lucky because of the, the, the fact that we are under the Rhinos rugby banner now and they have uh, a fabulous foundation, which is a charitable foundation. But as a consequence of that, they're getting to places where water doesn't. So not on the same scale as London, but we have a similar demographic in Leeds in particular. And, you know, the underprivileged, you know, the underrepresented, we're in there doing things with them. And the, the number one barrier has always been cost more than anything. Because we're talking about families here who have nothing. They go to school because they have to go to school. Um, but anything outside of school, they just can't afford to do. So it's removing that barrier and, and giving them opportunities to do sport without it actually costing them anything or just make a contribution if you can. Um, and so that's a really, really big initiative that we're trying to push forwards. And, and by doing that, you then find these superstars of the future. You find your next athlete, whether they're a netballer or not, but you find your next athlete. Um, and, you know, as far as the rugby were concerned, it was a way of them trying to get keep that, the, um, you know, the escalator going, bringing through new people, bringing them into academies and creating the stars of the future. Um, and we're also doing boys, boys netball, which has been really well received from five up to about the age of 11. Never thought we'd see the day, but yeah, we're absolutely loving it. And that must be incredible for you, Mags, to be a part of that and see that happening. It's, it's like, why has it never happened before? But again, it's always been the barrier of facilities or funds. Yeah. Um, and with it being a charitable foundation, they're able to get into those places, like I said. And, and we can do this without having to worry about funds or facilities. Uh, and Sarah, what about uh, Lightning? And also, what do you think that netball in general could do better in that respect? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Super League teams generally are kind of recognising the importance of connecting with with the communities. Um, you know, at Lightning, we we do all sorts of, like we do the usual stuff of of holiday camps and and things like that for kids. But you know, we started running a walking netball tournament. We um, have coaching conferences. We had a, a skills for school session, which was free for schools for for kids who don't play sport. You know, to come and try netball and rugby and cricket and and really join up on sports and, and try and get people interested I think like Mag said what's difficult what's difficult is the time people's time um from our point of view in terms of sending people into to different areas and and accessing different communities um because it's difficult you know like I think there's massively underrepresented communities and, and we cover Leicester and Nottingham um and you've got huge huge demographics where we're not really hitting those people at all in terms of 
offering them activity or you know having them aware of lightning as a team and as a brand and um i think netball is 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 kind of getting there you know slowly but it's going to take you know super league teams to have dedicated people on the ground to deliver these and and at the minute you know that's kind of still sits with england netball a little bit um it, it's starting to be taken on by super league teams but um th- there's a bit of a crossover period where where who who's doing this work and who has the capabilities to do it it's not a, a lack of desire for sure and, and a funding situation as i think we always come back to in netball it's, yeah. if the funds were there the dedicated people could be there couldn't yeah they? because i mean like how exciting if you can run sessions for free you know in like for for especially young young kids and adults who can't afford it you, like you you will dig yeah, up some talent people. and it's not yeah. always about finding talent you know sometimes it's just about getting people playing the sport but mm. you know for for super league teams that there is there is the kickback that if you provide those sessions you are likely to find someone who's never played the game before and then the first time they do they make it look easy so um it, yeah it's it's a lot of the time about funding and and, and money and people's time but thinking bigger picture though sarah it's about engagement and participation and getting people out of the, out of their house and just doing something it and is but but that's what i mean There's, that's where the crossover with england netball is like is yeah. that franchise's job yeah. because at the minute england netball have ndos um netball development offices and and various people on the ground and i think franchises are taking this on and especially from this area of, of like purely participation franchises are taking it on because they want to connect with the community and, and they want to provide something for the community but they're not funded for that and, no they're not yeah. and th- there's a there's a very gray area at the minute around you know who exactly is providing that and who should and who can um because i think everyone's doing what they can but there, there needs to be a bit of a more joined up approach I yeah think. agreed yeah, well, hopefully that's something that is going to develop and have increased funding in the future. Uh, now, the next subject that we're going to cover should be talked about more, but it just isn't. Uh, players focus so much on being the best they can be. They often sacrifice their own future happiness, such as starting a family, settling down, getting married. And in recent years, we've seen a number of elite players take time away from the game to have a baby and then return. Amelia Ann Ekinacio, Laura Geitz, Lauren Nichols and Renee Ingalls. But what, what happens if you're single? Uh, what if you're in your 30s you're in your prime um these are the kind of issues that netballers and elite female athletes always have to face um sorry without getting into too much personal detail what are your thoughts on this topic i think it's been I, I, like now it's come up i can't believe that it's taken so long for everyone to talk about it i think there was a a little bit of a rush on this when when players started having children mid-career you know liana leota's got like what five kids and and just pops them out gets on with them <laughs> um it's incredible but mm-hmm. i think i think when you know especially people like geitzy had had the baby and came back there was a discussion about that but there's not ever really been a discussion about infertility and people struggling to have kids and waiting and then it being too late almost and i think you know as a sport and as female athletes it's something you do have to consider and the likes of Jeeva and, and Sonia and Nat Medhurst bringing it up, the, the massive names in the game. And, and so I think it, it, it's great that it's been highlighted because it is something that just kind of gets rushed under the carpet. You're right there. Obviously, Jeeva's said how she's uh, had her eggs frozen in case she decides to have children in the future. It's a very invasive thing to do. Um, but, well, first of all, do you think that's going to become more common? And secondly, Sarah, do you think there should be this should be spoken about more? That even the fact of being a female athlete and looking after your body if you want children and the fertility side of it. Yeah, because why aren't we educating young players on this? You know, yeah. young players get educated on what to eat, how how many hours to sleep, what to put inside the body, on on their body, everything. And then we're missing a huge big chunk. Like you're a woman like this this is part of it if you if you want to have children like this is a situation you're in these are your options like you you need to think about it like if you want to continue playing and generally you know it's it's an issue faced by women generally it's not you know just unique to to athletes but the fact that a lot of people will put it on hold or or wait till later in in life to do it i think the risk factors just increase 
And this is going to maybe be a slightly controversial question, but given that, you know, it does seem to only have been more openly spoken about recently, do you think maybe because it isn't in netball as a sports benefit for women to go and have children and then try and come back, do you think that's maybe why they've gone, well, we don't need to discuss this? Well, across the board, isn't it? It is across the board, not just in sport. It's across the board for women, whether you're an athlete or not, whether you work in industry. You know, it's that, well, difficult really, because she's going to maybe want a child. She's going to maybe want to walk away. She's maybe going to gonna come back and want to go part-time. That just doesn't fit within our product. And, and it is so sad because I go back a lot longer than what Sarah does. And never was it ever discussed never if i even think about my own life with you know my my mum you know and school and stuff plenty out there about not getting pregnant and plenty out there you know people talk about that sort of stuff but nothing about well when you do decide mm. to this well, and it, it does open a bit of a can of worms because coming at it from a club's perspective like obviously i'm not going to go and, and talk to my players and be like Maybe you should just go and get pregnant. Like maybe you should think <laughs> yeah. children. You know, yeah, yeah. you've got a season coming up, but why because, don't you just crack on with that yeah. family planning? Um, and I think also in this country, well, it, across the board, really in every country, but it, it, it contract-wise, England netball and the Super League haven't addressed this issue at all. Is it in contract? Sorry, it's not. Contract? It's not in the standard contract. There's nothing about pregnancy, which is leaving it open to a whole array of interpretation like you could interpret it from a club's perspective as a long-term injury in which case you could give a player notice that you know the contract ends you could just have it as a long-term injury where you'd normally look after a player so you're going to look after them and you pay out their contract but if you don't put anything in the contract how do players make a decision yeah, they can feel insecure about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really blown away by the fact that it is something that could happen to a female at any time if they're active. And it's not in a contract. Yeah. And it's not an injury. So, oh, and, it, and it is. And I mean, this, yeah. like we, go, we go back a, a number of years and it was in, in contracts in New Zealand. And I, and, I, and I know the contract got changed in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, you know, it was sort of like, I think you got bought out your entire contract and then they reduced that time. In Australia, there's obviously something in there, I think, because Nat, Nat Meadows in that situation at the minute. Um, but I think if, if as a sport you're ignoring the topic, how do you expect your players to make informed decisions? How do you expect players to be open about it when we're basically pretending it doesn't happen? I think what they've done is, Sarah, it's that typical head in the sand kind of attitude that because they are involved in sport at the highest level thinking about children is not at the forefront of their mind and when they want to think about having kids think about retiring and then have your kids well and I, and I mean like Nat Medhurst is an interesting one because she's obviously gone through IBF so um <laughs> I mean like it, that in itself is horrendous well it is horrendous but also you're like there's no doubt that you're trying to have a child. Mm. So did that. you tell someone? Did she, or did you keep that well, under wraps? Well, I don't, and I don't know. And, and I think that all comes down to this contract issue because if, if you're going through IVF and you know in the contracts, you know, either you're not going to, like, you're not going to get paid or they could just terminate your contract, you're not going to talk about it. No. Um, whereas if it's clear, I think regardless of which way you go and, and regardless of what you think about, maternity leave and pay and things like that as long as it's clear i think people are making informed decisions, decisions. yeah but at the you, minute especially in this country i don't think people are do you think maternity pay should be in the contract of all netball players well i think you've got to first put in the bit that sarah was talking about the fact that they've catered for being mm. pregnant and then once they've catered for that then yeah it should it's a job for these girls the majority mm. of these girls it is their job so are they not then covered by some sort of you know employment uh, law that would mm. then bring in about maternity pay yeah uh, max obviously we know you've yeah. got a daughter yeah how, how did you find that do you know what for, for the first 25 years of my life i were in fear of my mother 
you know, making sure if you get pregnant, <laughs> I'll, I'll do whatever. And then, but it wasn't because I was just living the high life, traveling all over the world, playing netball, doing what I'd always wanted to do. And it didn't become a focus until I got engaged and was thinking about getting married. And then I had to start thinking about where am I going to fit this in? Um, I'm in a four year cycle from world uh, championship to the next. Do I dip out now and accept that that's it, I'm done? Because there was no, with no consideration whatsoever of coming back once you'd had that child um, because of the expectation that you are a mother and you need to stop home and look and after the child. I think even, even that, like we, we've, see, we've seen people do it now and, you know, Casey Corporal came back for World Cup, just casually come back, win a World Cup, leave again, brilliant. <laughs> Um, have another child have another child (laughs) get on with it but even even that thinking and I think that was the only time when I was playing internationally that children were talked about it was in those terms like is someone going to have a child between tournaments like Mm -hmm. between you know the world cup and the next com games now that's just massively simplifying the whole process anyway isn't it it's just like I'm gonna I'm going to yeah. get pregnant on this day yeah. and then the child's going to be born on this day <laughs> and then I'll have X amount of time. It's yeah. like, that, that's, that's not just how it works. Like but, Sarah, but that's exactly how my mind was working. So yeah. I thought to myself, right, I'm going to play this world championship. It finished it. It was in you know, July. I'll get married in the August. Um, hopefully, if all things work out, have this child by you know, August, September or something like that and be back to Nepal when the season starts in October. That was how I was planning it. But that's just such undue stress that you're putting on yourself on top of everything else in life. And, but, but, yeah. but, but not through no choice of your own, that pressure. But, and, but it is, and I think this is what we're talking about around education. Like, like people should know that that's not necessarily realistic. Mm. And trying to do that isn't realistic. And, and when, you, when you look at the, the struggles that some players have had trying to conceive and continue to have, that, like, you need to go in, into it with your eyes open. Um, yeah. What would you two say? If, so one of your players come to you, say, and they say, look, I'm either A, pregnant, or I want to get pregnant. As females who have played the sport, how do you approach that when they come to you and say that? I mean, first of all, I pray it's not one of my 18-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> because telling me is probably the least of their worries. Um, well, you're coming to tell my mum for me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm pregnant. Yeah. I, need, I need you to tell my mum. Yeah. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> Imagine Sarah breaking that news to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say. No gloss. No gloss. <laughs> she's pregnant. Yeah, she's up the door. <laughs> <laughs> just shout it across the sport. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's life. It, yeah, it, it's it, it's life, and and I think this is what we've been saying about this whole Corona thing. You've got to accept that things are bigger than netball. Yeah. So if someone's pregnant, especially if they've been trying to get pregnant and they want a family, it's a bit different if if they're panicking and you know it wasn't what they wanted. But if if they if they're happy about it, then it's amazing, isn't it, that someone's pregnant and that they're going to have a child and. Yeah, I mean, it's not amazing for me to, you know, lose a player for the rest of the season. But that's, that's a tiny, secondary, isn't tiny it? little speck of yeah. insignificance, really. But, but I think that will be really good for anyone listening to this is to, to know, actually, hearing from you guys that it would be acceptable and that you recognise that netball, whilst it's a big part of your world, isn't the be-all and end-all and that there are things bigger than it. So if I just start saying it is, because if you take the netball out of it and somebody came to you and said that they were pregnant, you'd be throwing your arms around them. Obviously, you can't at the moment, but you'd be throwing your <laughs> arms around them and you would be saying, congratulations, you know, well done, you know, went to baby shower, all the rest of it. Mm. Um, it, it affects you as a coach because it affects your, your, your best player and you think, cracks, what am I going to do? How am I going to backfill? But that should be secondary to everything else that's going on. You're um, also pre programmed to be mental and neurotic if you're a coach. So, absolutely. you know, absolutely. that's what players are scared of. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it is, like, and you know, it, it's, it's not unfounded that, that coaches have bad reactions to things. People mm. can't see. They're selfish sometimes, Sarah. They, they are. Selfish. People can't see what's bigger than, you know, the next game or that training session or whatever. So, I think it is a little bit about perspective. Yeah, and when I made the decision that I did decide that I wanted a child, 
when I did actually conceive, you know, and got to that point, I was classed as an old mother because I was the wrong side of 30. Mm. Whereas I felt in the peak of my fitness and health, you know, just come out of this, you know, this England factory and thought, yeah, I feel great, but I'm classed as an old mother. Oh, you can have all these extra tests. And you do realize that your chances of conceiving are, mm. are reducing drastically every single month. Yeah, and those are the kind of things you are told. So where the, you know, these elite athletes are now, I absolutely understand what they're talking about. And I feel for them. But I knew that my netball career at the highest level was over once I'd made that decision. Because to go back just wasn't an option. Not because anybody within the organisation told me that. I just knew that it was over for me. Um, support or not at home. I wanted to be at home and look after that child. Yeah, and I My think it's, it's exactly that. It should be your choice and there shouldn't be the pressure to defer that if that's what no. you want to do. And no. I hope that if anyone's listening to this now, um, that if they are thinking like that, then it might have helped them. So I think I, it's amazing I, that they are, there are athletes out there having yeah. both, having this elite career, having a child or children, and then being able to get themselves fit enough yeah. to go back to it. And the emotional strain of being away from your kids is not easy. It's not easy. Well, that, I think that's the other thing. Um, like Australia now have got in their contracts that the, the child travels with. Amazing. With and I'm incredible. Sad. I mean, I remember Tam's in playing um, the 2015 World Cup in Sydney. And we were away for not a ridiculous amount of time, but a decent chunk of time, maybe four or five weeks. And she just had to leave a child. Like she le left her baby for that amount of time, and like emotionally, it was oh, so God. tough for her. Yeah, and I mean, like I am not very maternal, um, but even I felt bad because you could see how much it, like, it was hurting Tamsin to be away from her child, mm. and and making that decision. I I don't think you're giving people an, an option when you're giving them that decision. Yeah, going, you can either play netball and be away from your child for weeks at a time or you can be a mother and really you're not helping that work together at all. I think more has got to be done to, to make players able to come back because it, it has worked in cases. Um, but here in this country, we've got yeah. Sophia Kandap and we've got Lauren Nichols coming back to Super League this year. That's the first real time. Absolutely. But then Liana Leota, who did a lot of it in New Zealand and, and finished internationally. So I think it's something that we, we as a nation need to get better at. Definitely. It needs talking about more. So we're doing the right thing to talk about, but there needs actual change in, mm. in direction yeah. with it. So, and it's something that we will continue to cover as well in Netball well, Nation. Well, probably the, the Netball Players Association, they'll probably pick this one up and they'll add it to, you know, the string of fabulous um, issues that they deal with. Because um, I can't see who else is going to pick it up. I can't see the governing body picking it up at England Netball, or they, they should. Well, I mean, nothing good for, comes from it from their perspective, does it? Like, they don't care if some beautiful babies are born. They, they want players to play. So mm, if, if, unless they're pushed, they're not going to no. They're not going to force this issue. And I mean, just whilst we're on this, can we just shout out Sonia McClomo, who's just come out in these articles as, as having had multiple miscarriages and, and the difficulties she's gone through. And for anyone who knows Sonia, just one of the best players ever, but one of just the strongest people. And so for her to stand up like this and, and kind of open up about what she's gone through um, is just phenomenally strong from her, yeah, but is. also just probably a beacon of hope for other people going through the same thing. And, and, good honour for bringing it up so that players of the future, you know, are, are going to be more informed and are going to be aware of, of what, what, what the possibilities are. Absolutely. It's that positive change that talking yeah. will hopefully bring. Absolutely. Right then, girls, on to the final section. This week was a year since Manchester Thunder staged a <laughs> thrilling second half comeback to win the grand final against Wasps at the Copper Box. Now, you played and won in Super League finals, Sarah. What did you make of that final? I loved it. I mean, I had a few lemonades watching it. And <laughs> I was having a thoroughly great time. Um, it was a good final because, you know, it, it sort of ebbed and flowed and Wasps were in the lead and Thunder came back at them. And I, I, I did really enjoy it. Um, 
as a neutral and well not not really neutral but mm. as someone who <laughs> wasn't hunt, like completely yeah. invested in the outcome um you get to in, actually enjoy those games but what was it like to see a former team do well without you um it was actually amazing because i think what people forget is that you don't like for me i didn't just go and play for a team to win and then leave and go and play for someone else and try and win my whole um like my whole mission was to to make those teams great for a long time so to see thunder like i went to thunder in 2000 and jeez nine <laughs> i don't know 2009 i think something around then they were bottom of the table they were struggling no one wanted to go there um and it takes time and what i'm most proud of my time at thunder is that i stayed there for seven years and then every year since i've left they've made semi-finals and they will continue to do that because they are not they've now got a model and a system where they produce really good players they know what they're about they know how they play the game everyone can spot a thunder team by the way they play and that for me is really pleasing because i like i've got skin in that like it's not about i leave and now i want you to do rubbish because i want my team to do well it's like i I enjoy seeing like the legacy that players create oh respect Berman. yeah i like that i like that (laughs) we weren't expecting that response i'm joking (laughs) Um, i know um, i hate them yeah yeah. um so max wasps and thunder formed quite the rivalry over the past few seasons Mm. were they the two teams that most deserve to be in the final and what what is it that makes them so good when you talk about who deserves to be in the final, you know, it is what it is. You win the most games, you end up in the final. And it's as simple as that. Mm. By merit alone, you end up there. So that's kind of like my answer to that one. As to what makes them the teams that they are, well, if we go back to the point where when Wasps were stepping onto the Super League ladder, they were in a fabulous position, or their director was to basically just go and handpick whatever they wanted. And that's what happened. You ended up with a team that was handcrafted with friends and fellow playing internationals. These girls all came together, very experienced, who wouldn't want to be able to go out and handpick what they believed to be a winning uh, set of girls. And that's what they did. They were sold a dream. The dream came true. You know, first year they won, second year they won, and then obviously shattered by thunder in the third year, which I'm sure everybody were pleased to see. For no other reason than, you know, you want to mix it up a little bit more than, you know, the same people. Absolutely right. So if you've got that opportunity to go and create and handcraft a team, then that's what you're going to do. Package was sold and it, it paid off for them. When you look at thunder, it's like a thunder factory, like Sarah was saying about, 2009 you know they were bottom you know she went there they were at the bottom of the league i don't think that there is any other franchise that has what thunder have it's it's unbelievable to watch what goes on there yeah the playing style is such that you know everybody knows it from being five or six seven or eight all the girls across the board are taught to play a certain way but the the what's fascinating is that for every single position that they may have that's on a netball court if you're not playing the best you can possibly play and excelling there's another 10 12 behind that are pushing and will play that position and will do it well and the majority of them pay for play for peanuts because Mm. they believe in their franchise and what it offers so two completely different teams two completely different styles um but what a great final it was yeah, and both, and both clearly work. Um, Sarah, sorry to bring it up, but you've also suffered some heartbreaking losses in your you career as well. You have to go there, Emma. <laughs> no. I wasn't going to let that slide. Um, as a coach and a player, but which one, if you had to single-handedly pick one, which was the hardest loss for you? Uh, 2014 Commonwealth Games semi-final by a mile. Um, because we, well, because we should have won it. And we lost to New Zealand by one. New Zealand were under strength because they had injuries. And I think we all believed so deeply we were going to win mm. that the loss just hit so hard. Because like, when you've got no doubt in your mind whatsoever, like we're going to win this game, and then you lose it in the last second by one goal. Um, like We didn't win the bronze medal playoff because people were just like 
shattered, like absolutely shattered, just could, could not like recover from it. And then um, what's funny is, well, it's not really funny, it's depressing. Um, that happened in 2014. Every Super League final I'd played in, I'd, I'd won until 2016. And 2016, we lost to Storm. Um, there's a very dodgy umpiring call at the end, but we won't go into that. Um, we lost to Storm by two. And again, like we, we expected to win it. But that, all I could think of was, well, you know what? I've been through worse. Like, I've, you were I've hardened. Lost, well, I've lost the Com Games semi-final and it really, this isn't, this isn't anywhere close. Like, it's awful. Like, we should have won, but, you know, cry, cry me a river. So it, it's tough. Like, it, it is tough to take um, because you know, when people talk about like you work your whole life for something, um, it, it's hard if, if it kind of gets ripped away from you like that. Um, but it's just life. Like it's, it happens and everyone's experienced it at some point. And, and, oh, sorry. So, sorry guys. Just getting a call through there and gone. Right. Sorry. My phone was on airplane mode, <laughs> but clearly it doesn't want to work. work. Um, uh, I mean, with that, mind you, it probably cut you off at the right time. You didn't look very happy talking about that, Sarah. Um, <laughs> right. But with, with the tough comes the good as well. And obviously, we can't forget that you won uh, Coach of the Year last yeah. season. Oh. Um, are you still basking in your glory? Yeah, because, you know, if we don't play this season, really, I'll have won it for two years. Two I? years. Two I'm not giving years, that trophy. Sarah. Really? Okay, <laughs> <only one. laughs> <laughs> I'm no, taking that, that double win. <laughs> <laughs> that, that did mean a lot to you, though, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, because one, it's voted for by other teams. So you know, contrary to popular opinion, I'm not. I'm not the most hated coach in the league. Um, <laughs> either that, or they're just scared of you. <laughs> well, I'll, either way, as long as they vote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but also because. There's so many good coaches in that league. You know, I look at, you know, Jess Thilby and Anna, Anna Stembridge coaching at Bath, absolutely fantastic coaches. Um, Greggy won the league with Thunder last year, could easily have got coach of the year. Um, so it's nice when you win something that is one, voted by peers, and two, is like the, there's a genuine competition for it. Like, I, I, there was a lot of people who could have won coach of the year. So, um, and you got, you got it two years in a row? And I've got it for two years, so... <laughs> no biggie, no yeah. biggie. <laughs> <It's all my laughs> people. Um, well, before we wrap up, ladies, have you got any shout-outs you'd like to do? Um, it is... It's Laura Malcolm's birthday this week, so I want to shout-out to Laura Malcolm. She's Happy birthday. Getting Happy dangerously birthday. close to that, um, that age when you can't get out of bed without a 20-minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> So good luck with that, Marx. Uh, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Laura. And, happy birthday. Um, Max, any shout outs from you? Uh, no, just the usual. Just stay healthy, stay happy and uh, just fill your time with, with lovely people and nice one, activities. One quick question for you, Max. Mm. What is this week's cake that you made? Oh, oh well, oh, Tuesday treat was Rolo and Malteser Tiffin. I can't even cope with this, Max. I, I hope that when we're allowed back in that studio, you're bringing these goodies in. Absolutely, well. I really enjoy you saying the word Rolo. <laughs> say, say, say it again, Max. <laughs> Rolo. 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 <laughs> That'll be the auction. Rolo it's tipping. Still. Yes. Yes, I'll Max. Some special girls. We love Thank you. Party. We, we cannot wait. Well, thank you so much for another great episode of Netball Nation. Before we adios for this week's show, here's a reminder of our competition. To keep your team netballing with Netball Nation, powered by Netball UK and supported by ASICS, we're giving you the chance to win a pair of ASICS professional double F black netball trainers for you and every member of your team so that when you're finally back together, you'll be wearing shoes that let you be the best you can be on court. And as Mags and Sarah know all too well, they're going to have your name printed on it. Uh, so they're going to go nowhere, basically, when you turn your back. Have you managed to have yours on, girls? Uh, yeah, but you've frozen, Em. Oh, oh, that is not a great look for me, that is it. That is... Uh, <laughs> it I've, well, I've it goes with your camper van, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't... I mean, you can see me, but um, I'm throwing my voice. Um, so, uh, have you had yours on? Have you been moving about in them? I might have walked around in the house with them. Can't get them, okay. 
Caught Sarah. Can I get a mug? Keep, keep it him clean. Mug. Keeping him clean. What about it. you, Sarah? I have had them on. I've not. I've not been on my bike, so that's why I've not posted a photo with them on the bike. But um, I have been doing a bit of a bit of running around in them, enjoying them. Nice. nice. Well. If you would like to win a pair for yourself and all your team, all you've got to do to enter is go to www.keepnetballing.uk where you can also read all the T's and C's. Best of luck with it. Thank you, as always, Mags and Sarah, for joining us this week. Thank you for listening to Netball Nation, powered by Netball UK. We will be back here same time next week. But for now, enjoy the sunshine. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. This is Netball Nation.